This morning we have a session on 3D printing and nanomaterials. Their time is now. We're, uh, I'm delighted to share the stage with two of the leading thinkers in this really exciting field of additive manufacturing, also called 3D printing, and nanomaterials, the building blocks of how we make things that, are, that couldn't be made any other way. So I'm sure most of you have heard of 3D printing and it's been uh, quite the buzz lately. And the key thing that we're gonna focus on in this session is the fact that its time is now, it's here. It's, it's gone beyond the phase of novelty and, and uh, prototyping and printing little uh, toy parts. Uh, we're making real products now with these 3D printing technologies and Joe and Julia are here to tell you more about that. Uh, but what's really exciting is that this technology is allowing us to do things that can't be done any other way. It's opening up new design spaces. It's allowing us to build products that could only have been imagined before. And there are also some interesting uh, creative collisions that are happening between the material science world and computing and cloud technology. And lastly, it's pretty exciting because if you build things from the nano scale up, you can do things that are both strong and light. So with that as a general introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to our first um, panelist, which is uh, Joe DeSimone. Joe is the CEO and co-founder of Carbon, and he is a leading thinker and innovator in the 3D printing space and a former professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So Joe, over to you. Great, Ken, thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much, Ken. Um, so let me start with uh, this image here. Uh, some of you may remember the device on the left, uh, mimeograph machine, and some of you may remember the smell. Uh, and uh, yeah, what's interesting about that, uh, it was a master template, sort of carved in ink, that made replicas, copies. And it was the mainstay of how people made copies. And then the development on the right of a digital laser printer came along. A digital fabrication technique, if you will. One that allowed everyone to collaborate and send around files and iterate. And many people argue that now what's written is better because of the collaboration aspects associated with it. It disrupted supply chains. People used to have large volumes of books pre-printed uh, and stored and now things are printed on demand. And when you think about that, and you go to polymeric parts, which are the mainstay of you know, all the seats and cushions we're sitting on, the components of our cars, all sorts of medical devices, you could argue we're still in a mimeograph age. Now the master template instead of carved in ink is carved in steel. It's a three-dimensional cavity. One heats up a plastic and, uh, and, and squeezes it into these cavities. Uh, the molten plastic cools, and then the cavity is opened up, and that's how you get the part out. And as the parts became increasingly sophisticated and complicated, the tools concurrently got complicated and expensive. And so you think about these tools are used to make everything, everything. So you think about autonomous vehicles. Ken was talking about autonomous vehicles. When you go from level one autonomy to level four autonomy, there's an 8x increase in the number of sensors. You go from two miles of wire in the car to 12 miles of wire. You need electrical connectors, you need brackets, you need the sensors. All of these product development programs are slowed down because you need an injection molding tool for every piece of the puzzle. The same for medical devices. And so these product development teams are laden with this slow step of carving their ideas and dreams in steel first in order to make the parts. And then what you can make has to be really simple because of the design constraints of getting the part out of the steel mold. Let alone supply chains. You think about all these spare parts that are stored in warehouses and have all the inventory and all the capital tied up associated with that. So we imagined, you know, what if 3D printing could operate in a fundamentally different manner that could actually grow parts and grow them quickly, <laughs> right? and to be able to make these objects in a way that's fundamental departure from traditional 3D printing. I think 3D printing is a misnomer. It's mostly 2D printing over and over again. And there's an opportunity for a breakthrough, and that's what we developed. 
So we published a paper in Science in 2015 and gave a TED talk on this topic that is a process that mimics the Terminator video you just saw. Basically what's happening is we pull objects up out of a, puddle, a reservoir of liquid. And at the bottom of that reservoir, at that tank, is a very special window that's not only transparent to light, but it's highly permeable to oxygen. And that allows it, the resin never to stick to the window. And it allows to pull these objects up where liquid comes in underneath the part, much like the Terminator video. So we're, try, we're trying to bring to life exactly what Hollywood talked about, to be able to grow these objects and lift them up out of the puddle. That window is very similar to a contact lens. It's optically transparent and highly permeable to oxygen. And oxygen quenches the photochemistry at the window that allows us to do this. In summary, we think of this as a software-controlled chemical reaction to grow parts. So we now have taken this technology and we put it into certain equipment that does this on a large scale. These are our printers on the right. This is a smart part washer on the left. Parts are printed in that manner. The digital thread is, con is connected as one goes from the different unit operations to make the parts. The parts are made, they're printed, they're washed, they're baked. And the digital thread stays through all these parts as we go through the manufacturing process. This hardware was designed with the same approach that one designed the Tesla car. In fact, our founding VP of engineering was the founding VP of engineering at Tesla. What's cool about the Tesla, it's still the only car that gets over the air software upgrades. Everything about our, about our printer, like the Tesla, is remotely controllable with software. So we're able to upgrade the technology every six weeks. The more people use the printer, the better it's getting. And we can do things now that we couldn't do just a year ago. And now we're beginning to put this hardware into, into manufacturing pods. This is 10 printers, two part washers with a robot in the center. And this, is, this will make millions of parts a year uh, out of a digital factory a factory that's flexible, that you can make anything that you want. And what's interesting, it's changing the way product development teams, whether you're doing medical devices or car parts, are changing. Because typically, what you'd have to do is you design a part on your favorite CAD. Then you go to a prototyping technology, which often isn't the same materials that you use traditionally. Then you'd have to go to the tooling, and then you scale it up. What our customers are doing is they're designing parts on the means of production. It collapses the product development cycle. So if you're a medical device company or a car company, you can make your products in much shorter periods of time than you could with a traditional product development cycle. So really changing things. So it takes us into this new world of, of beyond prototyping. This is sort of our mantra, stop prototyping, start producing, much in a way Mark Benioff said it was the end of software, cloud-based computing. Uh, we're really getting into uh, all manufacturing. And what I want to do is I want to let our, our major, one of our major customers describe for you in their own words what it is we're doing and they're doing. And this is Adidas. When we first started with the idea of Futurecraft, it was to sort of guide us, to set us on a path. It's a mindset and it's a philosophy to try things. We're always bringing in new influences, new ideas, new collaborations. 3D printing, for example, was one of these new technologies that really had unlimited possibilities. You know, the initial problem was, okay, can we actually make a running shoe out of 3D printed material that really works and works well. So when we started thinking about doing 3D printing, we wanted to use liquids, because liquids give you the most flexibility in material design. I think of light as a chisel. Light triggers the solidification of the liquid, but oxygen inhibits it. That allows us to have the object grow. What's really interesting about this collaboration with carbon is we're seeing a convergence of a completely new manufacturing technology. We're going to scale it with the best industrial partner in the business. We're able to deliver tens of thousands and moving to hundreds of thousands and into the tens of millions. You know, that's clear in front of us. We have this amazing opportunity to innovate the printing process, the liquid rising. And growing in that context can give you new design thoughts you've never had before and new performance capabilities. 
that wouldn't be possible by traditional manufacturing. This three-dimensional mesh structure, it's a lattice, it's a matrix, it's a web of individual elements. Each one of those little elements is tuned specifically for a purpose. These lattice structures behave quite differently than anything we've dealt with before. They're much different than foams. Now we have every individual area of the shoe to work with, which is a completely new horizon for us and a new venture. If you really want to make a shoe that's a size nine, that same shoe for someone who's 180 pounds versus 100 pounds has got to be different. We can go in within every single cell and engineer that exact cell to do exactly what the consumer needs it to do just for them. That's fascinating. That's going to change uh, how we create products and certainly how consumers experience products. And I think that's how we see something like Futurecraft 4D playing into the life of an athlete. I would say this is just the very beginning and you know that sounds silly and cliche but you know, who knows, man? I don't, I, I don't know what's next, and that's what's great about going to work every day. A little bit of a Westworld ending here. Yeah. But this will be the largest 3D printing application in history. Uh, Adidas makes 420 million pairs of shoes a year. Uh, we'll get to uh, 50 million pair, and uh, 50 of our printers will make a million a pair a year. So it's here, this is happening. And it's happening in a lot of other places too. Digital dentistry is taking off. Half of the printers we place this year are in the dental marketplace. I'm holding a set of dentures. You know, these are made five to 10 times cheaper than one made by milling. It's a much better product, it's much more comfortable. And there's 60 million Americans that can't afford dentures and it's not reimbursed by insurance. And so the ability to give people the dignity of uh, eating properly, smiling, you know, coronary disease is tied to oral health. You know, these are big breakthroughs. They're gonna reduce the cost of healthcare uh, going forward. It's all done by digital capture and uh, using cloud-based computing to, to facilitate that. Also, there's all sorts of consumer product applications where this is happening. I didn't appreciate the complicated physics associated with mascara brushes, uh, but you know some amazing innovation happening in a space like that. All sorts of brackets and other components, automotive components, as you can imagine, uh, for fluid handling. Uh, all sorts of brackets, uh, air control systems, cushioning systems. And what's interesting to keep in mind: once you start doing things digitally, then it can disrupt supply chains. You know, this is just an example thinking about all the climate control buildings around the world that are just storing parts uh, for decades even with tens of billions of dollars in capital uh, tied up in inventory. Thomas Friedman talked about on any given day, 2% of GDP is in UPS trucks. And so you think about ability to do on-demand printing or local for local production can be really profound. So the idea of having a warehouse in a cloud and local production can really transform things now that we've cracked the code where you can make products at quality and at cost. And then there's entire new breakthroughs. This is a company doing a, a new device for pancreatic cancer treatment. The entire product is being designed and iterated on the printer. This product development team is going so much faster than if they had to design this device using traditional manufacturing. So it's speeding developments up of these kinds of products going forward. So with that, let me end. I think it's what's really cool is, you know, we have cracked the code on how to make polymeric parts at quality and at cost, uh, and it really can disrupt and introduce new, new business models that we're very excited about. And look forward to uh, talking with you at the end. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. That was very exciting. And, um, I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this future where you can make products and actually have access to them in a way that's going to change our lives. Uh, up next is Julia, who's going to tell us more about the underlying science and some of the advances that are happening in our understanding at the nanoscale. Uh, Julia is the professor of material science and mechanics and medical engineering at Caltech and I also understand a concert pianist. So oh, yeah, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, there's no piano here. So, <laughs> Uh, Julia, over to you. It's tough to follow Joe, but I will do my best. Thanks. So, so in our realm of 3D architecting, we're looking at slightly different, smaller 
scales. So I'm showing the title here, Materials by Design. Perhaps you can all relate to this, especially after what you just saw, that you can really design the materials that we want. But then the next phrase that comes to it, three-dimensional nano-architected metamaterials, that's a mouthful, and I'm not at all expecting you to either understand it or to, what my goal is to convey to you why they all belong in the same sentence, because maybe each individual world, word makes sense to you. So imagine that most of you are familiar with a situation like this. You go to the store, you buy all these things you absolutely need. You really, really need them. You put them in plastic bags, and the plastic bags just don't quite hold out. So this is not the only example of materials breaking a little too easily. This is from the wine glass that never makes it to the toast, to the balloons that pop all too easily, to the I really meant to have four children situation. So these are all examples of materials that are lightweight, and because they're lightweight, they're very weak, and they're easily terrible. Now, let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's look at materials that we know to be strong. Of course, many of us are intimately familiar with, this, uh, with these devices. Many of us took an airplane to get here. So you may not realize this, but a Boeing 747, for example, weighs a million pounds. So the tremendous expenditures in the airline industry actually comes from the amount of fuel that's required to propel a million pound machine through the air. So the Dreamliner is already doing much better, uses 20% less fuel by a 50% weight reduction. So this is an example of materials that are strong, and because they're strong, they're heavy and therefore expensive. Now, here's another example. Of course, there are many solar panels that I've seen over here. So what happens if this guy slips off the roof? This is going to be bad news for everyone involved. The solar panel will, will crush, of course. So again, an example of materials that are necessary, specialized, but they're heavy, heavy and brittle. Speaking of materials that are heavy, whatever happened with the space elevator? Do you remember how in the last decade we were all describing, oh, discussing the there's going to be this great space elevator? Well, as far as I know, there still isn't one. And the reason why there isn't one is because of this. This is a very busy plot, so don't worry about absorbing it all, but just look at the colorful domains here. So I'm plotting here some kind of a mechanical attribute. It can be strength, it can be stiffness, it could be fracture toughness, as a function of density. And all the materials that we know how to make today are already plotted here. So this is the green or certain materials, foams, like the foams that Joe was describing. There are some metals you can see on the right. And the picture that emerges right away is that we know how to make materials that are simultaneously strong and heavy, or simultaneously lightweight and weak. What we don't know how to do today is how to get into the so-called white space, and that is how to make materials that are lightweight, very lightweight, so very light to hold, and very, very strong. Now, this is a so-called log-log plot, so even a small, modest increment within the space already represents a substantial change. So how do we get into that white space if everything we already know how to make is already plotted here? So the way we do it is by using the concept of architecture in our material design. If you look in the picture on the left, my left, it's the Great Pyramid of Giza, so this is the largest stone man-made monument. It weighs a tremendous amount, so it's 150 meters tall, okay, that's pretty tall. It weighs nearly six million tons. And because of the particular geometry that it uses, it poses a tremendous amount of pressure at its foundation. In contrast to the Eiffel Tower, which stands twice as tall, and it uses a thousand times less material, and it's just as mechanically robust. No wind, it's, it's been in operation built for a long, long time now. No wind, no mechanical environment, no extreme thermomechanical environment or anything like that has compromised its structural integrity. So what this tells us is that if you cleverly architect your structures, you don't have to use so much material, and you certainly can use a lot fewer slaves to construct it. So this is what we do in our group. We began this work by, using the soap, by making these micro lattices in collaboration with HRL. What you're seeing is the world's most normal dandelion. There's nothing photoshopped about this dandelion. And what you can see is that this entirely nickel micro lattice is hardly perturbing it at all. In fact, if I were to hold a micro lattice in one hand and a feather in the other and to release them at the same time, the feather would fall down faster. They're exceptionally lightweight, very lightweight. But what we're after is not just the lightweight. We're after the lightweight and strength at the same time. Well, to do that, you have to get down two more, three more, actually, orders of magnitude, down to the nanometer scale. So this is one billionth of a meter and about 100 thousandth of your hair diameter. Small, small, tiny materials. So what you can see here in the bottom right corner is a nano TARDIS. So this is those of you who are fans of Doctor Who, you can see that you can, we can make, write very small things. All of these black and white pictures are real images 
of the materials that we make in our lab. So they look a little bit like the kinds of things that Joe makes, but they're really, really tiny. So because they're so tiny, you can imagine, so they're, they're effectively straws. So imagine you're drinking straws that you constructed in a Lego-like construction and tessellated them through space. Now, these materials embody every length scale from some nanometers to hundreds of nanometers to micrometers, hundreds of micrometers, millimeters, and eventually once we're able to scale them up to centimeters in meters production. So they span so many orders of magnitude that it's no longer appropriate to call them just a material or a structure. They're a metamaterial. So it's, it's sort of a cheating way to call something we don't quite understand. Because we don't really, we can't really describe its properties simply from the materials perspective or from the structural perspective because they're all intertwined together at these very, very small dimensions. So, so what I already showed you is that they're lightweight, but I haven't yet told you is why they're strong. It's all about the size. Size really matters at these length scales. What I'm showing you here, again, is another plot. I'm a scientist, so I have to show you plots. So this is strength as a function of size, again, a log-log plot. And what you can see is this ubiquitous, smaller is stronger phenomenon. If you take a very malleable metal, like gold, for example, your earrings are made out of gold, right? It's very easy to bend it. If you reduce the dimensions of gold down to about 200 nanometers, it becomes the strongest steel. That's what I'm trying to show here. There are reasons for that, but all you have to do is just make something smaller and it becomes stronger. Well, not so simple. Take the same metals that we're familiar with, gold and silver and nickel and copper, and now let's make it in a slightly different way, such that the atomic level structure is slightly different. And all of a sudden, this effect is reversed. Smaller is now weaker. Well, wait a minute. So you smaller can be stronger, and sometimes it can be weaker. Well, OK, so that's kind of neat. But actually, this size effect is even more powerful than that. If you take a glass rod and you start pulling on it, so this is a glass rod whose diameter is about 150 nanometers, and we're going to pull on it. You know what happens with a glass rod if you pull on it, right, or try to bend it, or to, it breaks. But look at what this guy is doing, especially look in this region if you could see it. It's extending, extending, extending by 100% before it breaks. Things stop breaking at the nanoscale, things that should break, things like glass, window glass. You can extend them tremendously so before they break. And here's my last example. This is a ceramic. So imagine a piece of chalk. And we're going to now compress this piece of chalk. Many, well, try to, to compress it anyways. Look at what happens to this beam. It's bending. What happens if you try to bend a piece of chalk? It snaps, right? How many, those of us who are teachers, but we use chalk a lot, right? or those of you who have children, right? If you try to bend a piece of chalk, it doesn't bend. But this guy is bending, not just once, not twice, but it's almost like it's laughing at us. It's saying, I can bend all I want without breaking. So the takeaway message is this. Sometimes materials get stronger. Sometimes they get weaker. Sometimes you can suppress brittle failure. But all of these phenomena emerge only at the nanoscale. So if there was a way to capture and harness all of these benefits from the nanoscale, but now proliferate them onto a much larger macro scale world, then we, that's really the holy grail. That's how we make the materials in that white space. So that's the idea. The idea is that we now combine, so this is our little, well, okay. We combine the concept of architecture and the nanomaterials and effectively wrap a nano ribbon around a 3D architecture to hopefully elicit those properties. So all of our materials, like I said, are kind of tiny. The actual samples we make, are, we can make them about one millimeter cubed, and that's like a huge accomplishment for us, one millimeter cubed, it's still pretty small. Um, this is our torture uh, instrument, because we can't quite see them with our eye, and these are the different inquisition devices. We pull on them, we push on them, we do all sorts of torturous uh, experiments. So here's the big question. What I'm showing you here is one of those lattices. They're hollow. All the beams are hollow. It's made out of alumina, which is a very brittle ceramic. So imagine your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis. Very, very porous, very, very thin walled, so toilet paper like walls. And we're going to push on it, so we're going to step on it. What do you think is going to happen? It's very brittle, very thin walled, very osteoporosis ridden. It's going to break and crush and die, right? So let's see what happens. So we're loading it. So this is our little machine uh, applying the load from above. Bam, it crushes. We have a little nano cemetery in our uh, instrument. So you can see this guy is dead, 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 dead. Uh, well, okay, so by the way, the wall thickness here is 50 nanometers. So 50 billionths of a meter. Very, very small. Um, right, so we'll look at this and we say, okay, so it crushes and dies, nothing good about this. 
But now you look at the units here. So the units here are it's something we call stress, which is how much for, with the intensity of force. And this is measured in megapascals. Something that's 99.9% .9 air shouldn't have anything measured in mega units. This is still very, very strong. This is good. It should be kilo units, maybe just pascals, but megapascals. That's OK. So they're still strong. So not all is lost. So now let's repeat exactly the same experiment. Again, very, very brittle ceramic. And we reduce the wall thickness by a factor of 5. So now it's 10 nanometers. The difference is 50 versus 10. And let's see what happens. We're compre very brittle, should crush and die even more. We're compressing it, really compressing it. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to probably buckle right here and in, in crush and die. And wait, what is it doing? It's recovering. We just made a foam ceramic simply by reducing the wall thickness. So if that doesn't prove, this is all real. These are real videos. If this doesn't prove to you that there is, in fact, this nano size effect, I should just drive back to Poughkeepsie right now. So right, here's another example of this. So we decided to play around with them for various reasons and made fractal nano trusses. So you can see that each one, each beam is now reinforced like in a, in a big crane construction. And so we're compressing one of these. So you could see, you could see that each beam here is now made out of these fractal unit cells. And so you can see we're compressing and it's starting to kink right there. It's kinking. It's going to snap at any moment now. Very, very brittle. Again, keep in mind, this is like chalk deforming. And bam, it stands right back. And so just to show you this, did we hit the white space? Well, we really did. So some of these materials have never even seen, have never existed before because this is where the property space ended before. And we just bought ourselves two more orders of magnitude reduction in density. So these are very, very lightweight and also very, very strong and stiff materials. So you've been looking at this for a little while and you're thinking, OK, she's showing us pretty pictures. She's claiming that they're real, whatever. Um, how, what kind of applications, what kind of real world connections can we get? Well, so here we go. Th there's actually a smorgasbord of enabled technologies. Think about batteries. Joe just mentioned Tesla, right? Well, the problem with batteries, they're, they're all still there. You still can't go very far in the same battery. And these, the lithium ion battery technology hasn't really experienced a revolution in a little while. And we really need to change something about it and change something fundamentally. So. One fundamental change would be to start using silicon instead of graphite for the anode material because its capacity is an order of magnitude higher. Well, silicon is a very brittle material. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, silicon wafers, but you, all you have to do is just bend it a tiny bit and it cleaves. It just catastrophically cleaves. So this is a big cracking pattern that you see after you try to shove a whole bunch of lithium into silicon. So yeah, theoretically it would be great, but in real life it doesn't work. Well, so what we do is we actually make these nano um, silicon lattices. What, believe it or not, this is a top view of a 3D lattice. So this is a three-dimensional structure, just like I showed you, but you're looking at the top view. And what my student is going to do now is he's going to lithiate it. So watch the video. So he's lithiating it, lithiating it, lithiating it, and bam, it forms these buckling patterns. And you can see that this silicon, first of all, it doesn't crack. So that's what these patterns look like. They form these beautiful domains with, with uh, beams that buckle inward and outward, such that globally your electrode doesn't expand or contract, and it's able to accommodate all this lithium into it. And just to show you, these are not just pretty pictures. Here's the actual battery cycling data, so it's a real battery. So energy storage certainly has potential. Now, I work at Caltech. And uh, at Caltech, you can really only major in physics. You can major in physics with a biology flavor, with a planetary science flavor. You can major in physics with electrical engineering flavor. It's really all physics. More specifically, applied optics. Sorry, no offense to Sean and Constantine. But so we had to do a little, a little applied optics project. And what they sh these, uh, these um, lattices show is that if you push on them, they change color. So what these little peaks represent is that you actually shift the colors. So, Imagine you now have a whole bunch of these nano lattices and you stick them into ink and print something like money. And then if you touch it with your thumb, that's enough pressure to change color. So that could be an enter counterfeiting, counterfeiting uh, tool, for example. Now, 3D printing in many ways is interchangeably used with additive manufacturing. It's not entirely accurate, but one of the ways that it can manifest itself is that you're adding it in a layer type by layer type of a construction. Well. We figured out how to make really, really tiny structures that are made in an additive way. So if you start off with a resin, so in Joe's processes and in our process, you always start off with a, when we say the word resin, it's, it's like toothpaste. It's a polymer type of a thing. And then when it interacts with light, 
in, in our case, when it interacts with a particular laser light, it hardens or crosslinks the polymer within a little voxel. And so as that voxel is rastered in three-dimensional space, I can write a nano version of each one of you, and it'll take me the same amount of time as writing a simple cubic lattice. So for us, complexity comes for free. So we can write these lattices out of resins. But if you are clever, so at Caltech we have some brilliant students that are saying, we don't want to be slaves to this company called Nanoscribe where we buy the resist from them, we're, the resins from them. We're gonna make them ourselves. We're going to synthesize all the chemicals ourselves. So they design the chemistry where they can put metals into our resin, for example. So this is a, is a resin structure which we then can burn and the fancy word for that is pyrolyze, not in air, so there's no oxygen in it, um, such that it ends up with a nickel-only nanolattice. So what this is, is we're compressing this nickel nanolattice, which was entirely additively manufactured, whose unit cell size is two microns. This is the smallest ever metallic structure that was additively manufactured. Prototype, we only do prototypes on life. So, so Joey and I are kind of the yin and the yang. They do production, we do only prototypes, but ours are really, really tiny. So. Now you could see the you could really uh, see the stresses and the strains, and that just shows you how strong they are. So compared to other additive manufacturing processes for metals, you could see how rapidly it drops off with the beam size. So if you go from a millimeter to 100 microns, your reduction in strength is by 100 times. You sacrifice strength immediately; it starts dropping off. And now we even had to put a drop, uh, sorry, a, a break in the plot here to show you how much stronger our nickel, additively, uh, additively manufactured nickel is, it actually is comparable to something whose beam diameter would be 100 microns, only the diameter of our beams is 400 nanometers. So you can make things that are, again, reinforcing the point, very, very small without any sacrifice in strength, which is what you would expect. So as I finish up, what I want to say is that our main challenge is scalability. We can make them very small. We don't know how to manufacture them, and something radically different has to happen with the technology. Using our technology, you, we can't manufacture things. We can demonstrate a lot of really neat phenomena, but only in very, very small quantities. So the takeaway message is this. I probably said a lot of things here, and those of you who don't have scientific background might be, it's like, okay, I don't really know what the point was. Okay, here's the point. If you're clever, about three things. First of all, it's the atomic level structure of your material. We all are made out of atoms. Every material is made of atoms, and it's very important to understand what kind of atoms and what kind of interactions these atoms have. Secondly, the nano size effect of that particular material and the architecture that you impose on your material. You can create entirely new classes of materials with unprecedented properties, and most importantly, with unprecedented combinations of properties, things that are simultaneously lightweight and thermally insulating, or lightweight and very, very strong and stiff, that we have always been slaves to this coupling. We don't have to do this anymore. And the reason why we would want this is so that our kids grow up in the world where there are no hearing aids, because we'll be able to just write the cochlear a bone. You can directly write the bone and implant it in your ear. You don't need to have the de a special device. So that your iPhone 83 holds its charge for over a year without needing to be plugged in, so that the balloons no longer have to be filled with helium because vacuum is lighter than air. So we can just evacuate the air out of a nano lattice type material as soon as we figure out how to make them not porous. We'll get to the balloons. Um, and then, of course, the Christmas ornaments will never break again, right, because everything is uh, doesn't shatter the nanoscale. This is probably my favorite example. We all love chocolate, we all love brownies. So I think our next company is gonna be chocolate nano lattices, which are 100% taste, 99.9% air, and 0.01% calories. <laughs> so with that, uh, it's a huge thanks to all of you for listening, and we'll continue with the panel. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Joe. Um, well, if your mind's not sort of spinning right now, I don't know what we need to do to make it, make it spin. Really exciting opportunities. Um, I'd like to, to kind of build on one of your last points, Julia, and ask Was Joe the to chocolate? comment on it. It's, yeah. No, the point about um, scaling up and figuring out how to actually make things that, that can become parts of our lives. And so, Joe, your company is making real products today, but I'd like to ask you to take us back a little bit in time and share with us what was that moment in time when you realized that you could actually use your, your invention of uh, making things from this pool 
And you th when was that moment in time where you figured out you really could pull it off and, and make something at scale at the kind of quantities that companies would take notice of? So what, what was interesting when we, um, you know, prior to the invention, I taught about 3D printing in a classroom for a decade. And, um, and, and it, was, you know, it was always very aspirational about the opportunity, but it was clearly going nowhere. If you actually looked all the, at the parts, you just felt do, so dismayed uh, about the quality, and it just left you wanting. And so this idea that could we actually have a chemical approach, what's interesting, most of the scholars that did 3D printing at this point were in mechanical engineering domains and not a chemistry perspective. And so the idea that could we have a chemical approach to resin renewal. And so we actually had a very clear idea of what we wanted to try to do, inspired by that video. And, uh, and you know, the key was the window technology. And, and so we were searching for the right window with the right properties that had enough oxygen coming through. But when it worked, it worked like a champ. And we knew, like, once we had the right window in there, it worked, and we were starting the company and filing a patent the next day. So it was really a, a moment in time that was just spanning hours. It was pretty cool. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, so Julia, if I could ask you to comment on, you know, a lot of what you talked about was this trade-off between, uh, between strength and, and, uh, and size. And uh, so how should we be thinking about uh, that whole trade space around speed, size, strength, quality? If I could just generalize it and say, there's a real quality of the materials yeah. that we make. Um, wh how should we be thinking about that trade space as we think about moving from sort of prototyping and just sort of interesting science experiments into products that really are real. That's exactly right. You, you really highlighted the most important aspect of what 3D printing can enable all of us as a society to, to consider, which is the shift of material creation paradigm from properties, from rather structure properties to design properties. Right. So, there's this classical triangle in material science. So material science is kind of like this designer science that combines chemistry and mechanical engineering, some aspects of chemistry, some aspects of mechanical engineering, some aspects of uh, applied physics. In that, in the, and so there's this classical triangle which has structure, properties, and uh, processing. So what used to happen, and still happens to this day, with all the conventional materials like steel and ceramics, et cetera, um, all the Com comfortable materials that we that our entire world is built of is that you generally start with some kind of a powder or a liquid melt and then you put something into a furnace there's usually a heat treatment under some kind of pressure and then you get what you get and you don't get upset and the only way you get the the only way you know what the properties are of the resulting material is because you know its structure and you know its processing history because of that, it makes us be slaves to those properties because we can't do better than that. And that's in part why I showed the little property space. And just like what Ken is mentioning here is that we, we have a certain performance characteristic, right? So it could be a mechanical attribute, it could be strength, it could be toughness, it could be speed, like you were saying, it could be energy absorption, right? So for the shoes, for example, energy absorption over helmets, it's very important. It's a function of density, and density is what your payload is, so to speak, right? So for any airborne application or for any application where you want materials to be lighter, and of course we all want to feel more comfortable, so lightweight is generally a desirable quantity. So those are the two entities that have always, always been coupled together by this triangle. So right. to and get, yeah. So what you have to, what we have to do now is to really shift our mentality from that triangle to incorporating architecture into ah, it. And because that's what, adding architecture into the triangle, because that's what will allow us to stick with the same materials whose properties still enable the, pr pr provide the comfort so we know what the properties will be like in bulk form. But now we can architect it in such a way that you can, still rely on some of those fundamental properties of the parent material, but now by the virtue of architecture, you can reduce the weight and to get a new performance characteristic. Great, so, so one, one last comment, and I'd like to ask both of you to comment on this, and then we'll turn it to the audience for, for any Q&A. Um, you know, I, I got pretty excited about uh, the potential for 3D printing added to manufacturing and design at the nanoscale, listening to both of you, and it, it almost sounds too good to be true. And so when, when, you, when you see something that has all this potential, what, what are the downsides? I mean, what, are, there any, are there any warning signals or any concerns or, or like cost or, or uh, health concerns? Or, 
I, I'm making these up because I'm, you know, I'm not deeply in the field. So can I ask both of you to comment on what are the challenges that you've faced and what, what warning signs or, or concerns that we ought to be thinking about? And why haven't we just gone out and 3D printed entire satellites and cars and houses and things like that? So what are the, what are the limitations and what are the concerns? Yeah, so manufacturing's hard. I mean, you guys at Ford have been doing this for a very long time. And, uh, and then having all the statistical analysis and the quality control, you know, as you bring on an entire, entirely new manufacturing process, going through the validation, you know, we have some parts on some production vehicles now. Uh, we have some parts by Vitamix on blenders and components. It took years to qualify the part. The technology was developed, but the, it wasn't qualified yet. And so there is an intrinsic qualification process that one has to go through that's, that takes a lot of time and is pushing the technology to achieve standards that are necessary for the manufacturing. So you know, that's happening, and that takes time. So one of the big challenges is that you know, something like this, this is an FDA-approved product now, uh. right? It's an N of one. Every one of these is different. You imagine all the controls that you have to go through to ensure that that product is, when it's manufactured at hundreds of sites, uh, is the right product. All the data is there. And that's where we can exploit cloud-based computing, self-calibration for you know, distortion masks that are in the cloud. And so we really take IoT, Internet of Things, and connectivity and data to ensure that one can make quality products in ways that some of the legacy manufacturing techniques didn't avail themselves to or didn't have the ability of cloud-based computing to, to accelerate the manufacturing needs. Okay, great. Julie, anything to add to that? What's yeah, on your worry list? Actually, and I would say, that to add to that, I would say that the most significant uh, impediment, I think, from the insertion of these nanomaterials, especially uh, at small scales, because sometimes you only need 10 very small prototypes, and that's okay. It's the um, optimization. It's very, very hard to optimize these architectures. So I sh what the examples that I showed you were some that we chose in our group, but they're not optimized. To optimize something like that, you need a tremendous computation, tremendous amount of computational power, and you need to also know what it is that you're optimizing for. So once you know what your objectives are, developing a computational approach that's not prohibitively expensive and prohibitively, uh, and requires prohibitive no um, amount of computational resources, is very, very challenging. So these structures still, they're, they're, even in the research world, there's still the topology optimization remains a big challenge. So before you can even delve into the manufacturing realm, you need to make sure that your structure is optimized so that what, whatever it is that you're producing is optimal. So I would say that okay. that's the play. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the, uh, to the audience here for any questions. Please approach the mic and uh, uh, we'll take your question. This is fascinating, but I'd like you to comment. Recently, uh, there is a real troubling thing that happened, I believe, in Texas, where someone put on the internet that you could develop uh, a plastic gun. Yeah. And then, of course, that has all sorts of ramifications in security. Has there been any discussion about regulation of these products? How do we control this? Because this all sounds great, yeah. but it also has some evil to it. Yeah, great question. Uh, great Joe, question. Would you yeah, this? so we're in the middle of this discussion. You know, what's um, that's alarming. You know that this has happened, and the administration basically is supporting you know some of that now. You know, for us, I worry about that too now, especially because the new materials that are available are even more capable than they were even when that guy was doing his thing a couple of years ago and now it's proliferating. So I'm very nervous about this because we have great, we have materials that are going to be more useful in applications like that. Our printers, because of that and that and other reasons, our printers are available only through a subscription process. You know, we don't sell the printers. So we technically own all the printers, and it's a, it's a terms and conditions of an appropriate use, and we ban the use of weapons. We, dan we ban the use of our technology for producing weapons and ammo and all that. And so we get the ability to control that. We get the ability to decide who we want to work with. But you know, to your point, CNC machines, which are milling machines, my understanding is like a third of all the CNC machines in the United States are used to make support weapons. It's like an enormous number. So manufacturing tools are often intrinsically used for those applications, but not ours, because we ban it. 
and what's interesting about your question, and I just, if I could just generalize it, I think there's always a dark side to any game-changing revolutionary technology, and it's, it's, it's imposed upon us as innovators to think about how would we mitigate those downsides and dark sides. So thanks for your question. We'll take one over here on the right. Looking at these, looking at these two technologies from an investment perspective, uh, I'd be fascinated to hear you comment on the shape of the curve of development investors buying one generation of technology or equipment and getting quickly obsoleted out so that the next stage is preferable. Is it, does this have a curve, either of your technologies, that is readily discernible as to where we are? Yeah, so <clears throat> because of that, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a really thoughtful question because as you think about how do you best bring technology on board, get people to join you on the journey early without fear of obsolescence? Right? How do you future-proof your customers? And one of our board members, used to be CEO of Ford Motor Company, Alan Mulally, started this when he was at Boeing, before that he ran Boeing Commercial Aircraft Division. And he pioneered something called Power by the Hour. It was a hardware, so he, didn't, he wanted his supplier, GE, to no longer sell him jet engines at Boeing. He wanted Power by the Hour, or a subscription model, or hardware as a service. Because he always wanted the most fuel-efficient jet engines. He wanted to build airplanes. He wanted Boeing to give them the or GE to give them the best engines. So in that mantra, at Carbon, we don't sell our printer. It's a subscription model, and that allows customers never to be worried about having a paperweight, right? Because they can always upgrade uh, and and do that and and get into the value curve early and not have to worry about being obsolesced. Julie, can I ask you to comment on some? Of, what are, what are your thoughts about how your some of your innovations in your lab at, at the university. Uh, have you started to think about how you might um, get those introduced into, into companies through investment, or is it too early for you? Yeah, we actually just started a company to scale this up. Oh, awesome. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So, so like I mentioned at the end of our talk, the particular technique that we're using two fo called two-photon lithography is not amenable to manufacturability. There, there are certainly certain knobs that you can tune to make it to, to turn into to make it faster, but it's not ever going to be at the level where you can print sheets. So we're trying to, we have, we think we have developed a technology which is going to be able to enable us to print. So in a single laser exposure, instead of generating a single voxel, which is then has to be rested through space, we actually generate an entire field. And so we can use it in a stepper like motion to create sheets. And the idea is to create textiles or to create sheets, I guess, of these nano lattices, which are unterrible, unwettable, unbreakable, un whatever adjective of your choice, uh, but we would have to do it at some kind of a respectable speed. So for us, the investment part is certainly much earlier in the process. We're not manufacturing it, but we had to come up with a new technology. So this, it's the new technology development that's going to enable scalability here. So it's a, it's a different Great. approach. So I, can I just say a tiny anecdote about the name of our company? So these are all hierarchical materials. So we came up with hierarchical music, which is fugue, Bach uh, Road, so the company is called Enfugue. Uh, very Enfugue. clever. That's very yeah. clever. Look, we're we're almost out of time. We have a couple minutes left, and in those last few minutes, I'd like to ask both of our of our panelists to comment on a topic that's near and dear to my heart about this this area, which is the the fact is 3D printing, nanoscale uh, design of materials and architectures, new structural architectures to really embrace it and have it take off and have it really have meaning for companies that design and make things like my company. Um, you have to change the culture of the engineering community, and you have to train employees in how to take advantage of this technology. Can you comment on what are, the, what are the, some of the best practices or some of the approaches that you've seen that work well in terms of teaching engineers about the potential of this, this uh, really exciting technology? And, and if you're listening to this, what, what should you take away as far as how to, how to get involved and how to learn about it? So, yeah, for us, when we think about large companies in, in, using our technology, you know, I think the, uh, the issue is this holistic view. And one is training, you know, in fact, Alan said, how do we train 100,000 engineers to take advantage of the technology? That's right, because you have to do it at scale in order for it to take. You right? do, you do. And then how do you also do it where you take advantage of procurement and supply chain right. opportunities, right? And have this holistic view. And, you know, in the 1980s, this whole, the idea of a chief information officer or chief information security officer came in vogue right. for this new security cyber world that was emerging. I think in a similar way, there's going to be a new digital officer 
Mm. Uh, and, and to facilitate across a corporation, how does one take advantage of digital manufacturing technologies from supply chain all the way back up to design and take advantage of that holistic view that really is where a lot of value is created and not often captured? That's fascinating. That's very, very interesting. Julie, you have your thoughts? I think, you know, I have a different perspective uh, just to add to that is uh, I think we need to teach them about what uh, defects. I think that uh, right now in manufacturing, one a partic particular attention is paid to how do we, uh, quality assurance basically, right? So what, what is a defect? So I think in the 3D printed world, the definition of a defect is going to change. And so I think that the infrastructure and all the other engineering aspects will certainly naturally have to be, will, will have to retrain and the culture will have to change. But I think in particular, we'll have to change our notion of what represents a defect because in something that's entirely made out of discrete elements, the, the notion of a defect is very different. So how do we inspect these materials for quality? I think that will be a sort of a key change uh, in the culture. Awesome, well let's wrap up with, uh, if I could ask each of you to, to share with the, the audience here, what do you dream of making someday with this advanced technology? Well, can I, yeah. oh, uh, can I start? Ahead. Go ahead. I actually, I really, um, this is a perfect example. It's, to me, this is very cold inside of here, coming from California, but outside is very, very hot. So what our materials are someday, someday I hope that we'll be able to make, is a sweater or a textile like this, which based on the temperature outside can change its thermal conductivity so that my sweater, when it's really cold inside, it is keeping me warm. And as soon as I go outside and it's really hot, it opens up. So I am looking into this world of very multifunctional, smart, external stimuli type of materials which we can print by demand. You just go to a comp computational tool and you say, I want this kind of, these properties. And it tells you, this is the architecture you need, this is the material you need, and this is, this is what you need, and this is how much it's gonna cost. Um, and then you just print it. And, I'll and buy the, one of those. Yeah. If you, if you make one of those, i dollars per sweater. <laughs> I'm sold. Joe, what do you dream of making one day? So, you know, I certainly am excited about custom shoes, and that's exciting. But you know what? You know, if you're on a calf table and you need a stent, you don't want a standard size stent. You want a stent designed for your own anatomy. And the idea that an interventional cardiologist could be looking at your MRI scan or your CT scan, see the blockage, she could design that stent in real time on, on the screen, go to a cloud-based computational design, hit a button, and that stent's designed, printed on a, cath on a catheter just for you with your anatomy, those days are coming. And that's what I'm really excited about. I'll take one of those too one day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>